Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so yeah, my name's Carl Scotland. I work for Tech Systems Global Services. Uh, I'm based in the UK, live down in Brighton on the south coast of the UK, uh, and I lead our Agile Transformation Services practice. So I, I work with our coaches and consultants uh, in the UK and Europe um, that work with our customers. I also get to work with our coaches and our practice in the US, uh, which is good fun as well, working with them. But also we have offices in uh, Bangalore, so I was down visiting our kind of colleagues down in Bangalore yesterday, in, uh, down in EcoWorld. So that was, it was kind of a really good opportunity for me to, to meet some people as well and, and learn about the particular work we're doing with the customers over here. Um, I don't want to turn this into a sales pitch, so if you're interested in more about that, come talk to me afterwards. Um, but uh, you know, let's get into the content. So unwrapping the Agile present. Um, okay, this is a bit of a cultural test, probably. Does anybody recognize anything Know what this photo is about? Okay, there's no one. I, I guess you sir, raise your hand, mate. Okay, so this is uh, the, the clue here is this this badge here. This is Blue Peter. So Blue Peter is a uh, a British television program, television program, children's television program. Um, I think the longest, certainly the longest children's television program in the UK, possibly the world, but I might be kind of overstating that. Um, and this is a couple of their presenters. So Richard Bacon, Katie Hill. Um, and what they're doing here is they're burying a time capsule at the Millennium Dome. So the Millennium Dome um, was kind of a big um, project set up for the Millennium, big exhibition, turned into a bit of a white elephant in the end, so not successful. Um, it's now a big uh, music and concert venue and is very successful. So kind of interesting story that in itself in the kind of something designed for one thing has ended up being successful in another, in another thing. Um, but while they were building the Millennium Dome, they buried this time capsule in 1998. So time capsule got a lot of things put in it um, that represent kind of the world today, or in the world in 1998. Um, I can't remember exactly what was in it, but one of the things I think was a Spice, Spice Girls album on CD. Um, and the idea is that in year 2050, it gets dug up again, and everybody opens it and goes, wow, look at how the world was 50 years ago, that's amazing. What can we learn from that? Um, the thing was, in 2017, they were doing some work around the Millennium Dome. They'd forgotten that they buried the time capsule there, and they accidentally dug it up. And it got dug up, and everybody went, well, that's not really very interesting, is it? And I think they'd kept it in a museum somewhere, um, but basically a bit of a failure. There's a, there's a blog, um, a podcast that was about time capsules that kind of reminded me of this story and I think is a useful thing. Uh, you know, why, why, why time capsules? Why am I talking about time capsules and, and, and at an Agile conference? A time capsule, if you think about it, is an attempt to communicate with the future, to tell the future what you think the future needs to know about based on what you know today. So we're putting things in the time capsule that we think is important for the future to know about us. But what typically happens is, is a few things. One is they get lost. People forget about them. They never get dug up. They're just, they're just pointless. Or you get what happened at the Millennium Dome. They get dug up early because people forget about them. And, and then when they come up, they're usually damaged. Um, or usually the ones that do get dug up and opened when they're supposed to be opened are just really disappointing. Because people open them, kind of go, oh, wonder what's going to be in this time capsule. Wonder what amazing things we'll learn. And they kind of go, hmm, is that it? What was the point of that? So rather than trying to communicate with the future, and, and effectively what we're trying to do is, is influence and improve the future with the, thing, the knowledge we know today, the quote that came up in this podcast that really struck me and why I think it's relevant is, if we want to benefit the future, the future benefits from what we do now. Rather than trying to predict the future, and rather than trying to tell people what they should be doing in the future, let's just focus on what we're doing now. And if we get the world better, make the world better today, then hopefully the world will end up being better in the future. Now, I think that, that concept applies to agile transformations. So that idea of trying to predict the future and improve the future is what we can call the ideal future state. So kind of introduce some terminology here. Our current state is where we are now. And we want to define, predict an ideal future state. And what we do is we close the gap. We just kind of go, we're here. We should be there. Let's just do that and get there. The other way of thinking about it is what we can call present thinking. Rather than the kind of that gap thinking and closing the gap, let's just work in the present. So we have our current state. Let's understand our current state. 
And instead of trying to predict the ideal future state, let's work on the ideal current state. What's a better version of the world today that we can actually do something about today? Because usually these future states, big changes, big gaps, a lot of work. You can't do it in one step. So let's take one step from where we are today, the, uh, the current state, to that ideal current state. That current state, that ideal current state becomes the new current state, and then we can kind of go from there to the next ideal current state, and so on. And once we've done it step by step, hopefully the, the, the ideal current state that we end up at is, is the right place to be, because we're learning on the way. We don't necessarily know what those future ideal current states are going to be until we get to the new current state. And then we kind of go, ah, now we're here. Now we can decide what we should do next. So that's what I would call present thinking. And, and Jay Bloom kind of coined this idea of present thinking. And this is why I call this talk um, Unwrapping the Agile Present. So a bit of a play on words. Agile is a present that's been gifted to us. Let's, let's unwrap it and, and enjoy it and make the most of it. But to do that, we need to think about working in the present. Let's not try and define the future. So basically... Uh, the core message is, do your Agile transformations in an Agile way. I go into so many organizations where we're going to plan our Agile transformation, and we're going to define that future state, and all we need to do is implement our new blueprint, our new big framework that, uh, that we, we paid for. Um, now, let's just work on what can we do today. So approach your Agile transformations in an Agile way. And there are three areas that I'm going to talk about to do this. One is situational awareness. So how can we have a better understanding of where we are now? So understanding our current state, situational awareness gives it that. Strategy deployment, so strategy deployment gives some ideas of thinking about how can we start taking those steps and, and go through our agile transformation in this step-by-step -step way. And then similarly, deliberate discoveries about how can we focus on learning and experimenting while we're doing that. So we can discover what the next state should be as we go through the journey. So let's start off with situational awareness. Um, anybody recognize this code here? Anybody kind of has to guess what should be at step four? Anybody even kind of recognize the, you know, what it might even represent? Nobody. Sorry? Chess. Yeah, yeah. Okay, these are chess moves. Okay, great. Everybody, we know it's chess now, so we should be able to figure out what step four is. Nobody? Okay, what if I show you this? So the people that, if you don't know chess, you're still probably not going to be able to figure it out. But anybody that knows chess, does this look a little bit more meaningful? Anybody guess what the next move should be? Are you, are you, are you pointing at this one? I think. Okay, so it's, it, it's white moves next. So actually, it's this here. So if you move the white queen, take that pawn, it's checkmate. So this is, this is scholar's mate. It's like the quickest checkmate you can get in chess. Um, you only make this mistake once. <laughs> yeah. um, and I have done that. Um, my daughter started learning chess, so I thought, oh, I'll get back into chess and start playing online, and she beat me with this quite, quite quickly. Quite a, um, a sobering experience. Um, the, the kind of message here is, you look at this, this kind of written form, it's really difficult to understand what's going on. If you know a thing or two about chess, you're going to look at that. That visual form is a lot more meaningful. So this kind of gives us a lot more situational awareness by visualizing the current state and where the pieces are uh, and understanding the rules of what things might go. So how do we take that idea of, of visualizing our current state to create situa situational awareness? Um, so Simon Wardley created the concept of Wardley mapping. And basically, you know, he uses this metaphor. Um, a map to him is where you've, you've got two dimensions. Where you are within the, within the map has meaning, and therefore movement within the space has meaning. So the two axes are, um, here you've got the value chain. So the value chain, um, the things at the top of the value chain are the things that are most visible to our customers. And as we move down the value chain, and it's kind of a chain of needs, the things at the top need the things at the bottom. And as you move down the chain, you, you get further away, and those things are more invisible to your customer. So you can start looking at what are the capabilities or components, or the elements within our system, and how do they chain together in a chain of needs in order to meet customer needs. 
And then along the bottom, you've got this evolutionary axis where at this end, genesis, things are kind of brand new, emerging, um, we're kind of make, building things for the very first time, through to custom built, um, well, we know what we're building now, but we're kind of rebuilding it from scratch every time when we're doing it ourselves, through to the product and rental space, so now these things are so mature that other people can build them for us, or we're buying them from other people, or we're renting them, and then through to commodity where these things are so well understood that just, you know, they're just readily available from anywhere and everywhere. So we can start mapping our system onto this Wardley map. Um, so this is a really simple cup of tea. Uh, British example actually plays all quite well in India, I think, with Indian tea. But, you know, we've got our public. Our public wants to drink, so they want a cup of tea. In order to make that cup of tea, we need a cup. We need some tea, and we need some hot water. Well, to get some hot water, we need water, and we need a kettle. And for the kettle to work, we need power. So you can see how that kind of chain of needs works down, and we can start decomposing our system. But then we can also say, well, most of this is certainly kind of cups, tea, hot water, uh, water itself is kind of in that commodity space and, and power. Generally, you know, you, you just go out and buy these things. Cheap, easily available. Um, our cup of tea is kind of less commodity, kind of a product. We're making the tea, so it's a product that we're selling. Uh, we're, we're making our own kettles. That's interesting, isn't it? Why are we making our own kettles? So once you start mapping these things out, you start having conversations. So one, the conversation of figuring out what's in the value chain, where does it live on the um, evolutionary axis, allows us to start creating some shared understanding. That's that situational awareness. And now we can kind of go, well, based on that, what should we do next? You know what? We don't need to custom build our own kettles. We should be able to just go down to the, the local supermarket or electronic store and buy a kettle. Kettles are commodities. So that becomes a kind of a potentially a strategic play. This is something we can do to, to improve our business is let's just stop custom building kettles. We don't need to. Maybe, um, maybe our value is around the tea. And actually, we want to be known for our kind of uh, the unique and innovative flavors and styles of tea. And we're just using, you know, commodity tea. We're just going down the supermarket. In, in, I don't know, in Britain, we call it builder's tea. It's kind of just really basic um, tea, not the nice stuff. But hey, actually, we could start innovating in the tea that we make. So actually, we want to move tea over here. So again, that's a kind of a strategic play that we can discover based on this situational awareness. Or maybe, you know, maybe we kind of, we think we make some pretty cool kettles. Yeah, we're custom building kettles. We should be selling our kettles so we could move the kettles up the value chain so we're just selling kettles directly to customers. So this idea of, of having this landscape and what's, what, what are the pieces on the landscape, where are they, and how do we want to move based on that, um, it's what Wardley mapping gives us. We can apply that basic concept maybe to our processes and our ways of working. So there's an idea called maturity mapping, which takes that basic concept. We have a value chain still um, of the practices we use and how those practices relate to each other uh, and how visible or invisible they are to the customers. And we've got our, our uh, evolutionary landscape, but we kind of change the language slightly because we've kind of got novel practice, emerging practice, good practice, and great practice. Kind of not best practice, just great practice. Better than good. But you can imagine how, you know, we, as we start kind of doing things for the very first time and, and innovating around the things we do through to just, you know, we know exactly what we're doing and everybody knows how to do it. Um, we can think about, well, what, do our, what are our customer needs? Our customer needs us to be responsive. Our customer needs us to deliver value. Um, our customer needs us to really be, be delivering things of quality. Well, what do we need to be responsive? Uh, Continuous delivery, that'd be a good thing to do. Um, but you know what? We're still figuring out how to do continuous delivery, so it's over this end. Um, our customer, you know, to, to deliver value, we probably need some project management, maybe a backlog and some stories, quality, we need to we need test TDD. So we can kind of take that same premise and start understanding um, with maturity mapping, what's our maturity? Now, it's, it's called a maturity map because it's, one, it's kind of deliberately trying to um, play on the idea of a maturity model and a maturity scale. 
but rather than us measuring our maturity based on somebody else's view of what our maturity should be and how they define maturity, because this, this is a, just a free two-dimensional space, we're defining our own maturity about what we do and what we think we should do based on our context. So again, this gives us situational awareness of our practices. And again, we can say, well, hey, we, you know, we're still figuring out continuous uh, delivery, but we want to try and move that and get better at it. We think that's a, a good thing for us to be working on. And we can see how that fits into the overall landscape and why we're doing it, because we want to be more responsive. Product management, uh, yeah, we want to get better at that, but hey, maybe, maybe we should be moving our product management a little bit more visible to our customers. Maybe that's a good thing to do. Um, I had another example that I, that I didn't put a slide on here. I can't remember what it was now. Oh, it's, you know, backlogs. Is a backlog a good thing? We have a backlog. Do we need a backlog? I mean, you know, maybe backlog, we could just move a bit further away from the customer because they're not really interested in the backlog. They just want the value. So we can, we can have a discussion about that, and we can agree with it or disagree with it. But it creates us a shared understanding and a, a common situational awareness. So that starts helping us understand what sort of things we should be working on. Um, we then get into Kinevin. I, I meant to say earlier, if anybody's playing buzzword bingo, you probably tick all the boxes in this talk. Um, uh, if you want to know more about Kinevin, uh, go to Jules's talk. Um, so she's got one straight after this and one tomorrow. She, she knows much more about Kinevin than I do. But Kinevin, the way I think about Kinevin very simply is, if we know what to do, Kinevin starts giving us some idea about how do we go about doing it. Um, so Kinevin has, um, kind of a joke, five quadrants. Um, five domains, clear, complicated, complex, and chaotic, and then this um, AC in the middle, which is aporetic and confused. Um, don't worry about the aporetic bit. It's just when you're confused and you don't know. So clear is, is you know, the simple way I think about it. Everybody knows how to do something, so we can just do it. Um, you don't need to experiment. You don't need to kind of get consultants. And you should, everybody, you just need to do it. And if you're not doing it, then the question is, why aren't you doing it, usually? Um, and typically, it's we don't have time. Um, complicated is then when we, we know to go to experts. So both these things on this side are, are kind of ordered. They're knowable in advance. Um, clear, everybody knows it. Complicated, well, not everybody knows it, but we can, we can either figure it out or we can go and get some expert advice on how to do it. But then it's typical of just planning and implementation. Complex is, is when you're now unordered. And uh, the way I think about it is that when experts disagree, because there's actually multiple ways you might do this, and we don't really know which one, which way is the right way and which one's going to work. So this is where we have to start running some experiments, and we're really kind of getting into that learning cycle. Chaos, you know, actually nobody knows what to do. We just need to do something. Um, kind of like, let's just get out of the fire. Let's not kind of run some experiments about how to get out of the fire. We just need to get out of the building. Um, and then that kind of confused bit is usually where just everybody disagrees. We have no idea what we should be doing, why we should be doing it. Again, you, then you just need to kind of do something which is going to take you out of there, usually into complex. So there's a whole, you know, this is kind of one slide. If I spend a couple of minutes on it, there's a whole richness of stuff here. But it's a sense-making framework. It gives you some situational awareness about the work you're doing, what the type of work is, and therefore how you might approach, you know, do you just need to get some experts in to fix this, or do you want to start running some experiments, or maybe you just need to just do something really, really quickly. So the way we use this, um, and this is kind of screenshot, I've had to, to blur out a lot of the, the content. Um, there's, a, there's a Kinevin exercise called Four Points Contextualization, where you take a, a bunch of problems or challenges or opportunities, and you just, you, you get the exemplar, so you, you start off down here. Let's just pick an example where there's, there's, there's an approach we all know and agree on. Put it in this corner. Let's pick an example where an expert or research will determine a good approach. Put it in this corner. There's, a, there's no right approach. Experts are going to disagree. Put it in the top corner there. And nobody knows the approach, or there's no immediate apparent approach. Put it down. So you get four exemplars. So those are the four points. And then you start positioning the other ones relative to each other. And then you draw these lines at the end to kind of figure out what's in, in which domain. Um, so this is why we call it sense making. So the, the definition I like about sense making is the data precedes the framework. It's not a four by four matrix where you're kind of going, which corner does it go, which quadrant does it go in? You just map things out and then you 
and then a well, roughly these are things come together. Um, and anything in the middle is usually the ones that we want to, these things we want to talk about and try and understand why are we confused. Um, and then depending on where these things fall in, a, in any other domains, we can start understanding, well, what do we do about these? So I like, I like Kinevin doing this, this, this exercise and Wardley mapping alongside each other because you get some really good insights about what should we work on and how should we work on it. Because often these are the same things that, that are on the, um, on the Wardley map. Um, there's another ni uh, nice kind of Kinevin related exercise, and this is the exercise that Jules is running in the next session. So, I highly recommend if you want to know more about this. Um, it's a future backwards, so in this, it's another way of getting situational awareness. Um, this is an example like I did a few years ago where we ran the future backwards on the Agile community. Um, but you're looking at here, um, I kind of call it extreme heaven here. What would the like, absolute utop utopia be about in the future? So we're not, the, and it's extreme heaven and utopia because you're not defining a future state. It's like impossibly good. We're not going to achieve this, but let's, let's think about what that might be like. And then down here, extreme hell, again, not a, not a future state that's likely to happen because it's extreme. But you, having got that, and having in the middle, this is, this is the current state, you can then work back. So th this isn't actually a completed version because we should have steps back here. But what this tells us, so this is, this is current state. How did we get to the current state? And then what might lead us to that extreme heaven? What might lead us to extreme hell? And based on those conversations that you generally kind of get some insights around, okay, what opportunities are there? What things might we want to avoid? So another way of creating situational awareness and kind of creating a common context. Um, it's really interesting if you do this with multiple groups and then you start comparing and contrasting the different groups. Again, you start reinforcing and pulling out different perspectives, different experiences, and then you can start talking about those things as well. So Future Backwards is a, another nice exercise for creating situational awareness. Um, and then last idea around situational awareness is, is what I call true north. So we know our current state, that's situational awareness. We still need to have some idea of what direction we're going to go in. So when we're kind of going from the current state to the ideal present, how do we know whether that ideal, how do we know um, what's ideal and what's not ideal? So I, I think of true north as um, it's orientation, it's direction. So it informs what should we should do, but it doesn't tell us what we should actually do. And then the three elements are, um, it's, it should be challenging. So that's the idea of it's extreme. Um, uh, I think I've got an example later, but I, I worked in an organization and their, their true north was around instantaneous delivery and deployment of, of customer needs. Now, they're very likely to get that instantaneous where a customer comes in and says, can I have something in the public goes, oh, hang on, it's live. Very unlikely you're going to get that quickly. But that was kind of gave them a sense of direction of what they were trying to get to. So it was challenging. It was concrete because, you know, we were talking about deploying code quickly and the, the continuous delivery pipeline. Um, and then it's compelling. It was something that they really wanted to work on. So that intersection in there, I think, is, is what makes up a good true north. So if you've got your situational awareness and you've got your true north and you've kind of got a direction that you want to go in, now you can start on your journey. Um, and I like, I like this phrase here, and I, I can't remember where I picked it up from. I've not been able to find the source, but who you want to be, not what you want to do. So who you want to be as an organization how you do that, what you do, shouldn't really matter. But if you know what you want to be, that's going to give you a sense of direction. Okay, strategy deployment, the next topic. Um, so before we get into strategy deployment, probably just, you know, strategy, emergent strategy. So this is um, the way Henry Mintzberg describes it um, in his book on strategy safari. And the way most people think about strategy is we have an intended strategy, what we want to do, um, we then deliberately implement that strategy and we realize our strategy nice and easy. How many, how many people are kind of see that with strategy? It never works out like that. So usually it's unrealized and it doesn't work out. Minspec kind of describes this idea of emergent strategy. So all this other stuff that's going on, if you can use situation awareness to start recognizing all these things, then that strategy can emerge and you can align around that, and then you realize that strategy. 
So rather than most strategy is, you know, this intended strategy, in most organizations, it's the people at the top of the organization making centralized decisions, the experts saying we should do this. Emergent strategy is about allowing it to emerge from the people. So I define strategy deployment as um, where solutions emerge from the people closest to the problem. Because they're the people that know what the problems are. So if you can learn from the people closest to the problem, see what solutions they recommend and what solutions they're using, and then as those things emerge, that can lead us to an, an emergent strategy. So a couple of ideas around this. One is um, David Marquet's um, leader, leader model from Turn the Ship Around. What you're doing with strategy deployment is giving control. Rather than the kind of centralized decision making, give control to people to allow them to decide what to do and get that feedback and get that learning. Um, in order to give control, he says you need two things. One, you need to give them clarity. It's the clarity of intent. And that's, that true north is usually kind of a, a good clarity of intent. What are we trying to achieve? What do we want to do? And then you want people to be competent enough to do this. So uh, he describes this uh, in the context of a nuclear submarine. Um, you want people competent in sailing a submarine if you're going to give them control and make those decisions. Um, so um, within our organizations, do people know the intent of what we're trying to do? Do the people have the competence? If they do, then we can start giving them control. Um, this and relates to this other model. So Stephen Bungay writes about this um, in his book, Art of Action. I've got book references at the end in the slides. Um, this comes from um, Helmut von Malt, who was uh, the Prussian army, chief of the Prussian army back in the, the late 19th century, I think. Um, so alignment and autonomy. So the usual um, kind of mindset is these are two, two ends of an extreme. You can have alignment or you can have autonomy. You get alignment by taking away autonomy and just telling people what to do. Or you can give people autonomy, in which case they're going to do whatever they like, and you'll have no alignment. What von Monk said was, actually, these are two different scales. You can have alignment and autonomy. So you'll give people alignment by being really clear on intent. Clarity of intent, so people are going to kind of align behind that intent, and then you can give them autonomy in figuring out how they meet that intent. So it's very similar. I think this, this model here, um, so this is basically the mission command model that the military uses. Um, that and um, the, the David Marquet's leader leader model, very similar. And I think there's kind of a lot of overlap between them. Probably not surprising that they're both military based. So that's what we're trying to do with strategy deployment. Be really clear on what our intent is and get an alignment around that and give people autonomy in order to figure out how to do that. So related to that then is, is idealized design. Um, so idealized design comes from Russell Ackoff. Um, and this kind of two, this, this, these two things at the top here to be this really simple process. You imagine the current system has been destroyed. So you want to improve the current system. You do that by actually, let's just imagine it's destroyed, we don't have it. He, he kind of famously used this, and the story he uses was when he was working at Bell Laboratories, um, and they um, kind of reinvented the telephone. So let's just imagine we don't have any telephones. So we're not constrained by the past anymore. We're not constrained by our perceived expertise in this. Anyone come up with any, any ideas. So then you redesign this, the, the system for the present time. So it's called idealized design, because we're trying to create an idealized system, but it's really important. He's not trying to create an ideal future. It's something that is possible now. So it talks about it has to be technologically feasible. So you have to be able to technically do it. It has to be operationally feasible. So in the contents of our you know, organization, you know, it has to fit within our management structures. Um, and then capable of being improved. So again, we're not trying to create a snapshot single solution. We're creating something that's technolog technolog technologically feasible, operationally feasible, and capable of being improved at the same time. So, um, product and idealized design is neither perfect, ideal, nor utopian. So it's, it's idealized, not ideal, uh, precisely because it can be improved. So it's the best ideal seeking system its designers can imagine now. So strategy deployment is about kind of trying to come up with these idealized designs that we can improve. Um, and we're starting with a blank sheet of paper. We're trying to get everybody's input, everybody's set of ideas, um, not just saying, oh, 
You're the expert. You've been on this system before. There's a nice canvas. So this is this is Jay Bloom as well. Um, Bill's on that ACOF with a, a little canvas here. Um, and I've used this really successfully with quite a few customers. Present, present mess. You usually have to explain present mess because people kind of get a bit touchy if you start describing where their current context is a mess. But present mess is good, bad. I think it, I've not got the quote here, but um, Akoff has a very specific definition of what he means by a mess. And it's just kind of the entanglement of the current system. So it might be, a, it's a mess, but it might be a good mess, it might be a bad mess. It's just, I think life is messy, our organizations are messy. So there are good things, there are bad things. And the idea is, if we don't do anything to anything, our present mess will produce a future mess. So this idea, if we don't do anything, things are probably going to get worse. So what is it about the future mess that, that's important for us to understand? And then we can also talk about, well, what, what's this ideal or idealized future? What would we like things to be in the future? So this is a bit similar to future backwards, um, except maybe not quite so extreme that uh, ideas that future backwards uses. Um, and then we can get into the ideal present. So this kind of gets into what can we do now, today, which is gonna solve the present mess, avoid the future mess, and enable the ideal future. So it's not gonna implement the ideal future, it's gonna enable it, so it's gonna take us a few steps forward. Just mapping those things out on a canvas um, helps people understand what we're doing it, why we're doing it, um, what we're trying to avoid, uh, kind of builds on that idea of situational awareness and starts setting us up for strategy deployment. There's a technique I like to use this once we're getting into this, which is back briefing. So back briefing is a, another military technique. Um, uh, Stephen Bungay talks about it in Art of Action as well. Um, I define it as a process by which people can check whether the intent of their work has been clearly described and understood and whether their plans to carry that work will meet the intent. So this is an A3. Um, single piece of paper that we need that we can articulate and condense our thinking down onto a single piece of paper. Um, collaboratively, we've probably got a good understanding, but context, so that's the, what's our current state? What is it about the current state that's important that's leading to this piece of work? What's our intent? What's our goals? So what, what are we hoping to achieve? Um, and also what's the higher intent? So if we're kind of, our intent is, is to do some sort of agile transformation, why is that important to the business? And usually then the higher intent maps back to the context. So we're trying to fix something about the context. So you've got those three levels there. Context, where we are now, our intent about what we want to do, and then the higher intent about why what we're gonna do is important to the business. Um, who do we need to do that? What people, what skills, who's gonna be involved in this piece of work? What are our boundaries? So freedom and constraints. So what decisions can we make? That might be budgetary, that might be technology, it might be um, organizationally. Um, and what can't we do? So what, what are the kind of rigid constraints? So maybe we, so there are also budgetary, technology, organizational things that we can't do. Knowing what those boundaries are is important because then that's what gives people the freedom. Well, people know what their freedom are and know what they can't do. So that, that helps with that autonomy, um, but without um, hopefully avoiding disaster. Quite often, um, People are really good at, at knowing what their constraints are. Or oh, we can't do that, or oh, we can't do that. Ask people what their freedoms are. There's usually kind of silence, but then once they start thinking about it, you start coming up with ideas. And then what's your plan? Um, and I think a plan in terms of hypotheses that we're gonna test. What things are we gonna try? So the idea of back briefing is, is you've been given a mission as a team. You fill in this template yourself as a team, and you, brief it back to your, your management team, your leadership team. So there's two aspects here. Um, it helps the management team. Have they described the mission to you? So if you can describe it back to them, it means that they've described it, not have they described it, but have you understood it? So this idea of the curse of knowledge. Um, curse of knowledge is when we think, because we know something that everybody else knows something. And there's some great examples of where leaders have given a mission um, and given people some instructions and what they think they need to do. And those people have gone off and done something completely different. And it's because they didn't have a little bit of knowledge that the leaders had, that the leaders thought, oh, well, everybody knows that. So getting people to do that back briefing 
kind of did a, is a safety check and a feedback cycle on do people have people understood what you're asking them to do? Okay, last section, deliberate discovery. I, I need to speed up a little bit. How do we get learning? So people are going to start doing things. We, we've deployed our strategy. We're kind of giving people the freedom and the autonomy to start trying things out, to implement our strategy. Now we need to get some learning in place. Um, there's this really nice exercise. You, you can go to this website down here. So I'll share the slides and, and just do this online. Um, I, I kind of haven't got time to do it now, but you give people the, uh, the sequence 248. So I've got a rule. There's a rule behind this sequence, and what you want to do is ask people to guess what the sequence is. Um, and you do that by putting in some examples, other examples of things that form a sequence. So typically what happens is people go, uh, two times two is four, four times two is eight. So I think it's, you know, each is a multiple of two. Uh, so I'm going to go three, six, twelve. I know that the rule. I can look at that sequence, three, six, twelve, and kind of go, that conforms to the rule. And we can do that multiple times. And normally what happens is people think they know the rule, and the sequences you give to test the rule are um, sequences which positively reinforce your rule. So you're always trying to pass the rule. Now, actually, the sequence can't I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I'll let you in on a secret. The secret, the rule here is that numbers just are increasing orders of magnitude. So by saying 3, 6, 12, I'm not really getting any useful feedback. To figure out the rule, I have to go 1, 1, 1. Oh, 1, 1, 1 fails the rule. Now I've got some information. This idea of, of getting information, we have to fail things, otherwise we're just getting kind of positive reinforcement and we're kind of getting biased by it. So when we're trying things out or running experiments, it's not just about being successful, it's about failing as well, because it's the failure is when we get the learning. So this is the idea of information theory. Um, you have a probability of failure when you try something. If your probability of failure is zero, you're never going to learn anything. You're always right, which means you know everything. Or if your probability of failure is 100%, you're probably not learning anything because, because you're just constantly making the same mistakes. So you're getting that information, you're not doing anything with it. The sweet spot in the middle is around failure 150% of the time. Now, there's context to this as well, because when I got in the plane to fly over here, I didn't want only to have a 50% chance of that plane flight being successful. Enough. I wanted it to be 100%. So there's a point at which you don't want to be learning anymore, and you want to kind of go, they know how to fly planes. It's not going to crash. But when we're doing product development and we're doing organizational transformation, usually we don't have that certainty. Um, we're more in that complex domain. Therefore, we want, actually want a probability of failure. So failure is not a bad thing. Failure is what we learn from. So another, another X, um, A3 canvas, you can then start defining your experiments um, in terms, again, what's our context? What problem are we trying to solve with this experiment? What is our hypothesis? Um, I'll go into more about hypothesis in, in my mini workshop tomorrow. Uh, um, why do we think this is true? So I'm just kind of making random hypothesis. There's some rationale and some basis. Um, what are the actions we're going to take? How are we going to test for not just success, failure? So start thinking in advance. What does success look like? What does failure look like? What things are we going to be looking for both for, for both sides of this? And then similarly, follow up. What are we going to do if we are success, if our hypothesis proves to be correct? But also let's think about now, what should we do if our hypothesis doesn't um, prove to be correct? Because we've just learned something. Now, it, that might be as simple as just rolling something back or communication, but thinking about acknowledging ahead of time that we might fail and thinking about how we're going to detect that. Um, again, the A3, if you can kind of condense this down, collaborate on it, you're going to get a good understanding about the experiments and being intentional about it. And then running those experiments through, through a life cycle, the same way that we run our user stories, our features through a, a workflow on a Kanban board, visualize uh, and have a life cycle around this. So this is a um, uh, Jason, I can't say that now, go for Jason. Have a look at his blog. Um, he kind of talks about agree, urgency, negotiate, change, validate, adoption, very verify performance. So how urgent is your experiment? Negotiate that experiment um, with the people that are going to be impacted. Um, run the experiment and validate that it, it works and it can be done, and then you know verify the performance on it. Um, 
going to skip over this quite quickly. Just another another framework that I found really useful in this, in terms of running experiments, is four disciplines of execution, because they talk explicitly about a scoreboard, keeping a compelling scoreboard. So when you're running a, uh, your experiments, and you're hopefully you've decided what, what are we things are we going to look for that tells us whether this is success or failure. Keep a scoreboard of that, track that on a, a scoreboard. They use the word scoreboard rather than dashboard fairly deliberately because they talk about the sports metaphor of if you know the score, you know whether you're winning or losing. And, and they kind of say, uh, um, if you go to a, a sports game and you don't know what the score is, somehow it's not compelling. If you, it's useful to know whether you're winning or losing. So have a compelling scoreboard. And then a cadence of accountability. That's getting together and reviewing your experiments and reviewing your Kanban of experiments and looking at the results and deciding what have we learned and what should we do next. Okay, so um, I think this relates, I realize this, these kind of three things tie into this idea of, of good strategy, bad strategy. So Richard Rummel talks about strategy in terms of diagnosis or good strategy of diagnosis, you know what the problem is. You have some guiding policies that are gonna create alignment, help people decide what they should and shouldn't be doing and then coherent action are the things you're actually going to do, and those should be experiments in terms of deliberate discovery. So, um, that's kind of a, a really kind of lightning run through of a bunch of ideas. Um, hopefully you kind of get, get some of those, there's something useful there, move you from this idea of we're treating our transformations as gap thinking, moving towards about present thinking, defining and working on ideal, ideal current states, taking it step by step. Um, there's one last thing, I've got a few minutes left. Um, the X matrix is, is, is kind of a tool I really like using for, to try and some of this, bring this all together. Um, we have our true north, aspirations, results we hope to achieve. Um, strategies in, in this context become your guiding policies. Your tactics therefore there are your coherent actions, um, the, the experiments you're gonna run and then evidence um, the results of those experiments, the, the, the leading metrics that you're going to track, um, visualizing them on another A3 and showing how they relate to each other. So our true north informs our aspirations, enabled by our strategies. We implement our strategies with our tactics. Our tactics generate that evidence. Um, and then hopefully the evidence is evidence that we are achieving our aspirations. So these things start fitting together and hopefully are coherent with each other. So these little kind of matrices in the corner allow us to visualize the coherence, the coloration, correlation, and how these things contribute to each other. Because it's not kind of a mechanistic thing. We can't just kind of break these things down neatly. Um, so this is an example. So this is the, the true north um, instantaneous development deployment I described before. Um, the solid dots here indicate a kind of a really strong direct correlation. So this is kind of saying, if we can increase our productivity, uh, and this is kind of very abstract to realize, but we can measure productivity as a leading metric. Um, we think that's going to enable us to uh, our aspiration of having more releases. This one here, if we increase our productivity, the hollow dot means there's, there's some sort of correlation there, but it's not that strong. It's maybe indirect. So I think productivity probably will help reduce defects, but it's not direct. And then lastly, um, productivity has no correlation with reducing waste, and um, waste was a very contextual terminology for this, this client. Um, so it just gives you a nice way of kind of, one, it, it's, it's a form of situational awareness because we now have everything on a single page. We're getting into strategy deployment because we're talking about what our strategies are and deploying our tactics, so allowing people to figure out what those tactics should be and allowing this to emerge, um, and then because we're running these tactics as experiments with our evidence, we're getting into deliberate discovery and we can constantly review this and refine it. Um, it's not a one-off thing. It's just a, our best current understanding. And, and typically, I find reviewing this on a quarterly basis gives us enough time to work on the experiment. And then we can kind of go, okay, are our strategies right? Maybe our strategies are wrong. Um, are our tactics working? Maybe we need to work on something different. Um, are we, is, is our evidence telling us what we want it to do? Are we getting information from that? And ultimately, do we think we're on track to meet our aspirations? And this is, this is kind of generally what we're trying to do with, with an agile transformation. So I like to use these to, just to help bring everybody together on an agile transformation. Uh, final quote, I think I'm out of time. Uh, I'll give you just a minute, second to read that. Anybody know who said this? Okay, 
familiar? Anybody recognize? Okay, this is Anna in Frozen 2. Um, so this is a, um, kind of Dave, I don't think Dave Snowden came up with this, but he kind of popularized it. Um, if you watch Frozen 2, um, Anna is uh, kind of, she thinks her sister's dead. Um, Olaf, a snowman, she thinks is dead as well. She's stuck on her own in a cave. She doesn't know what to do. And the idea, what do you do when you don't know what to do? You just do the next right thing. So when we're in an agile transformation, we don't always know what to do. Figure out what's the next right thing. Take that step. You make a step forward. You learn from it. And then you can figure out what's the next step after that. Okay, those are the, those are the books I've referenced. I'll make the slides available. Um, and we probably haven't got time for questions, but I'll be around. I'm around for the rest of the conference. If you want to come and talk to me, um, I'd, I'd love to kind of talk to you about some of these ideas in more detail. Thank you very much. Ah, uh, yeah. So, I'm just going to carry on talking, but feel free to leave. This is, this is the book on the X Matrix. Um, it, it's, it's very, X Matrix is kind of very manufactury, so it's kind of quite a tough read, very dry, but there's nuggets of gold in there, and it kind of just throws the X Matrix. Art of Action is that kind of the, the military and back briefing and that, that model. Good strategy, bad strategy, just, you know, strategy in general. I think Richard Wilmot's kind of take on strategy is my favorite one. Turn the ship around is that kind of idea about leadership and leading with intent. Um, getting the right things done. Um, I didn't talk about this explicitly, but there's, there's lots of A3s, and it introduces this that idea of using A3s for strategy deployment. Idealized design has, you know, that model, and you only need to read the first few chapters of that, really, to kind of get a feel for it. And then um, Four Disciplines of Execution is it's probably one of my favorite books just on um, it doesn't talk about strategy deployment explicitly, but just those four disciplines um, are really useful for any transformation, I think. Hi. Uh, great presentation, Carl. Um, the true north uh, exercise that you showed, mm -hmm. typically uh, with whom do you do this? Do you do this with the, all the coaches or the senior leadership who's sponsoring the Agile transformation, or at what level do you do to get the most in results? Um, it kind of depends what level in the organization I'm working. So if you're just working with a team, sometimes just a team having its own true north. Um, what I'll tend to do, though, is, is whatever level of the organization you're working with, when you get that true north, kind of go, go up a level or out a level, and kind of go, hey, this is, this is our true north. Does this make sense to you? So try and get some feedback on it. Um, if they kind of go, yeah, that sounds like a great true north to be working on, then, then you've now got some validation. They might kind of go, no, I, actually, I'm not quite sure that's right. I, I thought your true north should be something else. So that's that idea of back briefing, of just kind of trying to use that collaboration and communicate, hey, this is what we're doing. This is what we think our intent is. Is that right? Have we, have we understood our mission correctly? Understood. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.